what do we do? So this is where proof of work comes in. I'm sure you've, re you've heard the term uh, proof of work many times. And the whole point of proof of work is to choose a minor at random, even if one entity tries to pretend to be a large number of minors. So how do we, how do, we do it? What happens is every block uh, defines a certain puzzle. Yeah? So this is a cryptographic puzzle, um, which we'll denote by x. Yeah? So block number n defines puzzle x. Now, what is a puzzle? A puzzle is basically a problem that takes a certain amount of work to solve. Yeah, so let's say that um, we'll call the solution Y. So Y is a, a solution to a puzzle, and it's very easy to, to verify that a, if a particular Y is a solution to puzzle X. So to mine a block, basically the miner has to find the solution Y that solves the puzzle X defined by the previous block. Yeah, and that allows the miner to create the next block, the next block is going to define a new puzzle, x prime. That's going to have a solution y prime, and so the system continues. So how does the miner find the solution x? Well, let's suppose that the density of solutions is about 1 in 2 to the 70. That's roughly the density in the Bitcoin proof-of-work system now. Yeah, so that means that 1 in 2 to the 70 values of y is a valid solution to the problem. Okay, so how, do, how does a miner... Uh, find that solution. Basically, he's going to try lots and lots and lots of random y's until finally he finds one y that solves the puzzle. How does he do that? Well, he's just going to try over and over and over and over and over again until he finds a y that works, and that's roughly going to take 2 to the 70 tries. 2 to the 70 is a very large number, yeah, but the, basically the, the miner is going to uh, run basically for, for uh, enough time to try 2 to the 70 different values until he finds a solution to the puzzle X, and that, let, that lets him mine the, the new block. Okay, so of course it's an assumption <clears throat> that there's no faster way to find a solution. If someone figures out a way to solve the Bitcoin puzzles faster than trying lots of candidates at random, you know, obviously they'll be able to become a dominant miner because they'll be able to solve to find solutions before anybody else. Okay, so the point here is the first person to find the solution Y to puzzle X is the one that gets to publish the new block and, re and win the mining miner rewards. Okay, so that's basically what we say here, that whoever finds the solution Y first publishes their block and gets the, uh, mints the new block and gets the mining rewards. Now, in some cases, we might have uh, two people who find a solution at the same time. Uh, that introduces a fork, and I'll say that Bitcoin actually has a mechanism uh, uh, to uh, handle these forks, but uh, I will not discuss that here. Again, this is something that we, we, we cover at great length in our uh, blockchain classes. Okay, good. Um, so we already said that the miner who finds the solution Y is the one that mints the new block and therefore wins the mining reward. So in Bitcoin, the mining reward is 12 and a half Bitcoin. In Ethereum, the mining re reward is five ethers and so on and so forth. So generally, in a proof of work system, the miner who actually finds the solution makes a lot of money from finding that solution. Okay, good. So interestingly, the probability of actually finding the solution is proportional to how much compute computing power you have, yeah? So uh, if you have a lot of computing power and you can always find the solution, that means before everybody else, that means you'll earn 12 and a half Bitcoins every 10 minutes. And just so you realize, that translates today to around $90,000 every 10 minutes. Yes, that's basically what uh, the maximum amount that a miner can make if they're able to find a solution every time. Well, so the fact that this is how much money they can make every 10 minutes puts an upper bound on the amount of power that, that economically makes sense to spend in finding a solution Y. And so if you just put this um, together, so just look at the price of power, so $90,000 every 10 minutes, it translates to about 18 terawatt hours of energy at any given time. So this is the maximum amount of energy that economically makes sense to use for proof of work if you're still gonna be making money from, uh, from mining, and that applies to the whole ecosystem as a whole. Of course, miners are not even close to spending this much energy for finding solutions, but this is in some sense a theoretical uh, maximum. Nevertheless, it's kind of interesting, just as a kind of, <clears throat> as a funny uh, anecdote, it's kind of interesting that if you look at how much the country of Ireland, how much energy the country of Ireland makes, well, they make about uh, 26 terawatt hours um, at any given time. And so it's kind of interesting that the uh, maximum theoretical amount of energy that makes sense in a Bitcoin network 
is basically comparable to what the entire, an entire, entire country makes. Now, again, this is actually incorrect. It's not true that the Bitcoin network actually spends this amount of energy to, um, to find the solution. Why? This is just a theoretical maximum. Nevertheless, uh, we know that there's actually quite a lot of energy being spent to find these Ys because there's competition among miners to be the first to find the Y. And the more computing power you have, the more likely you are to find it and to find that Y and get the mining re reward as a result. So there's a lot of competition, a lot of energy being spent at finding these solutions. And really, uh, there's not a lot of benefit to that energy other than creating these new blocks. Okay, good. So that's what uh, proof of work is. The reason uh, it prevents, pres presumably prevents these civil, civil attacks is um, if you're going to say that you can control many miners, that's going to be expensive for you because you are going to incur quite high costs in the power that uh, your hardware is going to demand. Yeah, so controlling many miners is uh, not that easy. So that was the idea that would lead to presumably decentralization of the mining infrastructure. In reality, unfortunately, that hasn't quite happened. And so if you look at blockchain.com, they will tell you the distribution of miners for different blocks. So for every block, we can identify the miner that mined that block, um, right? That's the miner that gets paid the Coinbase. Um, and so we identify the miners and we can look at a particular 24-hour uh, window to see who mined the most blocks. And so you can see that, um, you know, btc.com mined around 20% of all blocks. Antpool mined around 14% of all blocks and so on and so forth. If you sum up, the top four, you'll see that together they uh, control about 55% of the Bitcoin mining power, which means that every other block is uh, mined by one of these four. Yeah, so in reality, there's actually quite a lot of centralization um, of the mining power, which is kind of a problem with uh, the proof of work system. Okay, I should say though that uh, consensus protocols and proof of work is a fascinating and extremely interesting topic. There are lots and lots and lots of attacks and lots and lots of um, game theoretic uh, issues around, around mining, how to distribute rewards and so on. Um, it's a fascinating and long and large topic, which I won't be able to uh, cover here, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> but again, we, this is something that we cover quite uh, extensively in our courses. If you want to learn a little bit more about uh, proof of work and the issues with proof of work, um, there are beautiful attacks that are kind of interesting to look up. So I would suggest looking up an attack called selfish mining, an attack called feather forking, um, and many others. And so you can just look for those terms and, and read a little about um, issues with proof of work and attacks on proof of work uh, on your own. However, I have to say that because of the energy uh, expenditure with proof of work and also the fact that it doesn't quite lead to decentralization, the more modern projects are moving away from proof of work and eventually proof of work actually might be phased out. So just to give you an idea for what's coming to replace proof of work, because we still, we still try to pick, uh, generally speaking, try to pick miners at random and we try to do it in a way that's civil resistant. Um, and so two ideas that have come, have come up is one called proof of space, where the idea here is rather than choosing a miner proportional to how much uh, computing power that miner has, we instead choose a miner proportional to how much disk space that miner has. So this encourages people to use their disks to win, uh, you know, to win the mining rewards. But disks are very are energy efficient, so it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to require a lot of power to actually compete in this in this environment. All you need is uh, a lot of disk space, which presumably you already have for other reasons. Yeah. So there's a a blockchain being created that uses proof of space in proof, instead of proof of work. Another idea, which is uh, very popular and many blockchains actually use, is what's called proof of stake, where again, instead of uh, uh, committing to resources like computing power or space, instead the miners put up collateral, which we call stake, so they use coins themselves that they bought as collateral for behaving honestly. And then if they ever misbehave, they're penalized in some way. For example, in the Ethereum network, there's a proposal um, to basically uh, what, what's called slashing, where misbehaving miners will ask, actually lose some of their stake. Yeah, and there are many examples of proof of stake systems. I just listed a few here if you want to read a little bit about how these proof of stake systems work. It's still a very complicated um, concept to get right. Uh, there are a lot of ways to design a proof of stake system that would be in a non-stable equilibrium. Uh, that might actually uh, uh, become unstable. 
Uh, and so this is actually a fascinating area. It's still an area of research. Um, but as you can see, there are already experiments in place that are experimenting with proof of stake. So no energy being wasted here. Um, and instead, we use, uh, we use uh, stake um, uh, to, to, to choose the miners. And finally, I'll mention there's another approach called uh, quorum systems, where instead of choosing miners at random, basically we say we designate miners that we trust. Um, and essentially, new blocks are issued by a quorum of miners. You can imagine maybe you know, 20 miners that are distributed all, all over the world, perhaps run by large banks, large reputable banks. We just happen to trust them to run the, the blockchain correctly. And if they do, then they're the ones who are allowed to issue blocks. And there are a couple of systems in that uh, paradigm. Uh, Stellar is a good example. Um, and so, again, no energy being wasted here. It's basically the blockchain is being managed by a collection of miners that the users decide to trust. Okay, so that's another example of a consensus system. Okay, good. So that's what I wanted to say about consensus mechanisms. And so we're almost done. Uh, in the next segment, I'll just tell you a few final thoughts, and then we'll conclude.